Hello, and welcome to the Salem Visitor Center. My name is Andrew Carr, and I was born and raised in Salem, Massachusetts, also known as the Witch City. This nickname stems from an episode that occurred in 1692, when 20 innocent people were executed for committing witchcraft. 14 women and five men were hanged by the neck on Gallows Hill. One man was pressed to death with heavy stones, and an indeterminate number, five known, died while in prison. Now, like any tragedy in our nation's past, be it slavery, JFK's assassination, or 9-11, one would assume that it is treated with respect and dignity today. And in one instance, Salem does. This is the Witch Trials Memorial, a somber and poetic tribute to those who died. If the rest of Salem upheld this reverend tone, I would not be speaking with you here today. But there is another monument at the other end of town that more accurately reflects Salem's relationship to the witch trials. This is a life-size statue of pop culture witch Samantha Stevens from the TV show Bewitched. It was unveiled in 2005 as part of TV Land's rerun campaign and depicts actress Elizabeth Montgomery riding a broomstick across a crescent moon. Now, despite your love of the show, which actually took place in Connecticut, it's hard to deny that placing a whimsical statue in a city where people died is extremely insensitive. I think my father summed it up best when he said that it's like TV land going to Auschwitz and proposing to erect a statue of Colonel Klink. Regrettably, it is not the only example that makes light of our dark past. The Hollywood portrayal of a witch with green skin, hooked nose, and black cat is now at the heart of an entire tourist industry known as witch kitsch. Vendors peddle elaborately decorated witch hats, street performers cast spells for tips, and tourists huddle around cauldrons with magic wands raised for take-home photographs. When it comes to souvenirs, the silhouette of a cackling crone can be seen flying across t-shirts shot glasses, magnets, postcards, and keychains, to name just a few. Similar iconography can be found all over town, from store signs to the Salem High School mascot. It is also incorporated into the Salem News masthead, the police department insignia, and the official city logo. <clears throat> now, Lori Cabot, the self-proclaimed official witch of Salem, takes offense to these stereotypical depictions, accusing businesses of exploiting a family-friendly cartoon to make money. At the same time, Cabot cashes in on tragedy in a different way, the Wiccan religion. Since the early 1980s, Cabot has sold spell kits, magic wands, cauldrons, crystal balls, and other magical supplies. In addition to her occult books and workshops, Cabot offers half-hour psychic sessions for $150. Quote, witches have a right to earn a living, she stated, and in Salem, they do. There are currently over 17 Wiccan shops that perpetuate the false notion that witchcraft was once practiced here. Keep in mind that there were no witches in Salem. The Puritans executed did not read palms, cast spells, or brew potions. If anything, they had far more in common with the Christian far right, a group that frequently protests Cabot's Wiccan ways. But when the myth of Salem, or witchcraft, is so profitable, it's easy for Wiccans as well as souvenir shops to sweep away facts with their brooms. The one institution qualified to offer professional exhibits, scholarly perspective, and authentic artifacts and documents related to the trials is the Peabody Essex Museum, but they choose to ignore the topic altogether, leaving a very sensitive period of history to be tourist traps that care more about entertainment than education. The credibility of these historic museums is immediately apparent by their signs, which all depict the mythical witch with pointy hat. Misinformation continues on the tour itself, as poorly stuffed mannequins inhabit two-bit dioramas of courtrooms, jail cells, and other domestic interiors. As tourists are corralled closer and closer to the gift shop, they must listen to a dramatic narration with eerie music and the occasional scream, 
an experience more reminiscent of a haunted house than a historic museum. This frightful spin on Salem's history is common, if not inevitable, when you consider the amount of tourists who visit Salem expecting to experience a little black magic. Interest in the macabre is in such demand that many establishments have opened with no apparent connection to the witch trials whatsoever, except for being spooky. These fright sites, which range from uh, horror cinema museums, cheesy haunted houses, and highly inaccurate ghost tours, are so ubiquitous that Salem has earned itself another nickname, Disneyland for the Dead. The commercial trivialization of Salem's legacy began in 1982, when the city introduced a weekend-long haunted happening celebration. It has since grown into a month-long festival of parades, costume balls, psychic fairs, and other eerie events. For a city struggling to find a tax base, haunted happenings is a major economic engine, attracting over 250,000 people and generating over $30 million in direct local revenue. When the buses arrive for the Halloween season, the lines begin to swell and common decency goes out the door. Here we see people texting on the Witch Trials Memorial, a gentleman dressed as a zombie posing for tips behind a gravestone, and this woman who's wearing a costume that pays touching tribute to those who died. For just $37, you too could own the Salem Witch costume, which includes a bloody noose, a bloody apron, and nylon noose. Or perhaps if costumes aren't your thing, you could buy this Salem t-shirt offered on Zazzle.com. The designer of this t-shirt was clearly inspired by the t-shirts offered at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida and the Book Depository in Dallas. Why is it that two of these shirts are unthinkable and one is $14.99? When it comes to the Salem Witch Trials, it seems like there's no consideration for the dead anymore. And with new hotels being built and cruise ships docking at the local wharf, the Halloweenization of Salem will only grow. And with every new tourist trap that opens, the farther from history we stray. The witch kitsch is already out of hand, and many, like me, are at the rope's end. To remind people of what actually happened in 1692, I plan to reenact a witch hanging execution on June 10th, 2017, 325 years after Bridget Bishop was first hanged on Gallows Hill. This performance is meant to shock some reality back into a city that caters to souvenir-hungry tourists who prefer hocus-pocus to fact. This educational demonstration will bring history to life for the general public. High standards of authenticity will be implemented as viewers watch an actress playing Bridget Bishop being carted to Gallows Hill and then hanged. Although details of the executions are limited to a handful of primary sources, there is enough evidence for a faithful recreation to take place. According to her death warrant, for instance, we know that Bishop was hanged on Friday, June 10th, sometime between 8 a.m. and noon. Sheriff George Corwin was responsible for safely conveying Bishop to the chosen site of execution and then hanging her by the neck until she died. Prisoners accused of witchcraft were often shackled in their cells to prevent their specters from escaping to harm others. And Bishop was undoubtedly restrained en route to her execution as well. Following British custom, her hands were most likely pinioned in front so that she could pray before she hanged. Rather than being uh, put on a horse or coach, Bishop was towed to her death in the rear of an ox cart, like a pound of meat or load of manure. This placement was symbolic, for even the death procession was meant to be moral punishment. Many eyewitness accounts mentioned the large crowds that attended the executions, and these spectators either lined the street or walked along with the cart as it traveled a mile outside of town to a site known today as Gallows Hill. The title is a bit misleading, however, for many historians do not believe that gallows were used during the executions. Timber was costly to hew and transport, and yet there are no records of prisoners paying for it. Surprising when they were billed for 
court fees, prison meals, transportation from jail to jail, and even hangman's fees. Trees were a far cheaper and convenient substitute, and before June 10th, it is believed that a black locust tree was chosen, preferably one with high branches so that more people could see the body. Rather than standing on a scaffold, a ladder was placed against the trunk of the tree to gain elevation. Bishop's spectral restraints now served a new function to prevent her from panicking and putting up a fight. It's one thing to remain composed en route to the execution and another as you're about to plunge into eternity. Although there are no descriptions of Bishop's final moments, it's safe to assume that Every step of the ladder must have been terrifying. Once Bishop was in position, the hangman tightened the noose around Bishop's neck. It was at this moment when many of the witch trial victims prayed or declared their innocence one last time. And then the hangman turned over the ladder, a process appropriately called turning off. If the drop was long enough, the noose would have snapped the highest and thinnest portion of her spine, known as the atlas joint. Long drop hangings, however, did not come into use until the mid-1800s. It is far more likely that Bridget Bishop died from strangulation. During a low drop hanging, the pressure of the noose causes the tongue to push back and up, which seals off the breathing. Dying this way can be agonizingly slow, as it was for Anne Hurl, who in 1804 hanged for over three and a half minutes before she finally succumbed to asphyxiation. Watching Bishop's face contort and her feet desperately kick to find ground must have been a horrific sight. Once dead, her body was cut down and unceremoniously heaved into a shallow ditch for it was against the law to be buried in consecrated ground. This reenactment may seem morbid, but it is no less gruesome than other violent historical reenactments we approach with great respect, such as the Battle of Gettysburg, where thousands of soldiers are slaughtered. Similar in tone, June 10th will be a day of remembrance. Hopefully it will restore a sense of perspective to Salem and honor Bridget Bishop's memory. In order for a safe and authentic uh, reenactment to take place, funding is required for stunt coordinators, actors, park rentals, um, oxen. And if you believe this idea has any merit, please consider donating at ropesend.org. There you will find information about Bridget Bishop, the Salem tourist industry, as well as the reenactment itself. Thank you.